Welcome to Victory Live, streaming from the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We're glad you've joined this week's worship broadcast live on our Facebook page and as well as our website. At the conclusion of the message today, we will give you more information on how to better connect with Victory Baptist. As you prepare for this week's message, grab your Bible and follow along as we join this week's Victory Live broadcast. Church. Light the first two candles of the Advent wreath, the candle of hope and the candle of peace. Now we light the third candle of the Advent, and that is the candle of joy. As the coming of Jesus, our Savior, draws near, our joy builds within our anticipation of his birth. Isaiah 65, 18. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people to be a joy. The 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. Father, we do anticipate the coming of your Son. We thank you for the gift of him to this world. We just ask that you bless this time together and bless this coming Christmas season. We ask this in Jesus' name. guys would stand with us and continue to worship. Yes, 
we're grateful for you sending your son for us, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, I pray that today that you would speak to us in your word uh, as we worship you uh, in that way. And Lord, I pray uh, that you, your presence would be felt this morning. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we sang in the song just before this one uh, that talks about all our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. And it says to us, it helps us to understand how that is so, because he is the redeemer. And all of our hope is in him because it's what he has done, not what I must do that brings to me salvation. And that is the great gift of Christmas. And um, we are promoting throughout this Christmas season, Christmas, a savior is born and Jesus has been born and Jesus continues to be born in the lives of people as people hear the gospel or are confronted with the truth of the gospel and they begin to acknowledge the fact that their hope cannot be found in them because they are not perfect, because they know who they are. They know of their own brokenness. They know of their own despair and their uh, times of discouragement. But when we see Jesus and we acknowledge him as the great Emmanuel, the world waits for a little miracle. Well, a little miracle beyond the fact that we woke up this morning and had another breath and God presented us a day that we can rejoice in and be glad that he has given it to us it is the miracle that God looked down upon us and said, I love them too much to let them go. I care for them too much to allow them to just wander. I'm going to come, I'm going to send my son. And the great thing about that message and the truth of that message is that God knew that before he ever before he ever spoke a word of creation. Don't allow anyone to ever lead you to believe that Jesus coming was a response to your sin, that it was an afterthought. It was not. God had a plan in place before the world ever came out of its chaos. And that's why it's important for us to recognize that as we think about the, the trouble that we may see and the, the challenges that we face in life. And sometimes we think, well, there's just too much chaos in my life. There's just too much going on for me to really be able to embrace all that Jesus is about and all that Jesus, according to the preacher, has come to do. But let me just tell you, the thing that we need to know is that Jesus has always come into the chaos. When he spoke the word of creation, you say, well, I thought God created. Yes, God created, but Jesus is God. Let me just say that again. Jesus is God. Amen? And everything that was created was created by him, and everything that was created by him was created for him. Therefore, you need to understand, I need to understand, that he created me, he breathed the breath of life into me, and I have been created for him. Therefore, my life was worth his life to redeem, to buy back from the bondage and the penalty of sin. And therefore, as we light this candle, this pink candle today in the Advent season, the candle of joy, there should be an overwhelming joy within us to know that God's love is so great that he sent his ransom from heaven for us to be our redeemer and that's Jesus and I think we need to come to a place where we acknowledge today the fact that what God wants from us is to understand that when Jesus came he didn't come bringing a, a list of things for you to do or for me to do he brought a list of things that he's done for us he reminds us as he reveals the Heavenly Father to us through his life. This is what God has done. I, I love how the Bible over and over again reminds us of how God loves us. And you go back to the Old Testament and you see how God was constantly reminding his people, whether it was through 
a promise and a covenant or whether it was through a prophet who was coming, whether it was through a judge who was being used to deliver the people out of the hands of their enemies, or whether it is the message of, and the promise of the one who is coming that God promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, reminding us that, hey, we're not going to be left alone. We're not going to be left without hope because God already has taken care of it. He's already provided for it. And he's constantly reminding us, I know the plans I have for you. I know what I have in store for you. And these plans, they don't, inclu they don't include destruction. They don't include despair. They include a sense of blessing, prosperity, prosperity in the right manner, the right way, understanding God's purpose for us. And that is for us to live in such a way that we begin to recognize that the blessing of God is not what we hold in our hand, but knowing that he holds us in his hand. I love how he spoke out of the exile to a people in exile. He was speaking of them coming out of exile in Isaiah 41, verse 10, and he says, do not be afraid, for I am God. Do not be dismayed, for I am the Lord, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Listen, I love how the psalmist reminds us over and over again that we rest in the shadow of his wings. David says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous abandoned. We look around us and we, we ask questions wondering sometimes, is God listening? Is God aware? You better believe it. And we need to be thankful that we do rest in the shadow of his wings because it is his blessing to us. And therefore, he reminds us today that our hearts should be filled with joy. Look with me at Philippians chapter 4. We're going to turn there. You'll find it on the screen, but I hope you'll take a moment and turn it to you. Philippians chapter 4 in your Bible and follow along and maybe make a note or two of this message because this is a very important message for us. And I want us to think about Christmas and what is it that Christmas does for the believer. And I, as I speak today, I'm speaking to all of us and speaking to anyone that is here. But I want us to focus just for a little bit of uh, most of our attention today on the fact that Christmas reminds every believer that we should risk it all for Jesus. We should risk it all for him. And you know, what, you ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that we risk it all by just living out that which God has already declared that is our life. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that everyone who believes in Christ, who embraces Christ as Lord and Savior, we're a new creation. And if we're a new creation, then we simply need to act out that creation, that new creation that's in us. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 as he came to him, he said, you must be born again. There must be something new. You see, Jesus came to be that something new. And when he came into the world, he brought a new understanding of who God is and how God wants to relate to all of us. And God promised that in Jeremiah, through the, Jer the prophet Jeremiah in, verse, in chapter 31, when he said, I'm going to write my law not on stone as I have in the past, but I'm going to write it on your heart so it'll be close to you, so it will be there so that you will know it, so that you will be able to experience that. And therefore, in the New Testament, we see that Jesus in John chapter 14 promises the comforter who will come and the comforter of the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us, lives within us so that we can have the peace that passes all understanding and know that it guards our hearts and our minds to the glory of God. So listen to these words, the words of God for us today words that are eternal words for us, beginning at verse four, Philippians chapter four. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true 
and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the peace of God will be with you. Emmanuel, the peace of God will be with you. Shalom. The Hebrew word for peace, but it is also the Hebrew word that is used for greeting. Shalom. God's peace will be with you. When we consider all the things that God has done for us, all the things that God has provided us through Jesus Christ, there should be within us this overwhelming joy. And therefore, Paul, as he's speaking into a specific situation within the church at Philippi, he's talking about the fact that there, there are a couple of ladies that have been really important to him and his ministry to the church there, and something has happened, and they have reached a place where they are at odds. And so as Paul is giving the church instructions as to how to deal with that situation, he's saying, what I want you to do is I want you to rejoice, be full of joy, and I want you to understand that this is an imperative. It's an imperative because there is joy that resides in you, and that joy is the presence of the Lord. And Nehemiah says to us that it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. And our strength that comes from the joy of the Lord and the assurance that he is with us should be that which guides us and directs us. And when we see a brother or sister or two sisters in the fellowship that are at odds with each other, there should be enough courage and enough graciousness within us to be able to go to them and begin the process of healing and restoration. Too often we have a, we have a situation where we would rather choose sides than try and bring reconciliation. And Paul says, listen, if you're going to rejoice, you need to understand that the very heart of God as Jesus came into the world was to reconcile us to the Heavenly Father. And it's important to understand that God never moved. God has always held the same position. He's always loved you. He will always love you. Dangerous statement, but it's absolutely true. There's nothing that you can do to cause God to love you more. Neither is there anything you can do to cause God to love you less. Now, we need to be careful how we use that and how we say that, but we need to understand the principle is there and the biblical doctrine is there that God's love for you is so great that he, he sent Jesus to come. And if that is true and we become, we become the product of God's love as a new creation, then it should be, our hearts should be filled with joy. And we should be people that recognize that one of the great benefits of walking with Jesus is knowing that we've been reconciled to the Father. And not only that, as we've been reconciled to the Father, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And so out of this situation between two women in the church, two, two women that have played a major role in that church, Paul is saying, listen, I, I want you to approach this situation. I want you to risk it all for Jesus because this is important. It's important that you recognize that Jesus came to reconcile, and as he came to reconcile, he also is sending us to reconcile, to work in reconciliation. And how do we go about that? Well, let's see these words again. Look at verse 4. Be filled with joy. Be filled of the joy of the, joy of the Lord. Let, every, let everyone see you as considerate. Another translation of this says, allow your graciousness to be on display. You see, you, you want to bring some reconciliation. You want to be a part of risking it all for the Lord Jesus. Then we need to be people who are very considerate. There are a lot of people that live in our community. A lot of people that we have casual contact with throughout the week. Maybe someone at the restaurant or maybe someone at the checkout counter. And especially during the busy season like Christmas, they are overwhelmed with all of the people, and they are overwhelmed with all of the demands of the people. Have you ever noticed how when we get stressed out, we get a little more demanding? I don't know if that's true of you. I know it's true of me. I know it's true of me losing sight of being considerate sometimes. And I think that's important for us to, to acknowledge that as we are going through that checkout line, 
knowing that that individual has been dealing with people that might not have understood the calling and the joy of the Lord that rests in them and reigns in them that should be controlling their life. And they've not heard considerate things. They've not heard kind words. They've not had people that have tried to bless them with understanding. You see, Jesus is saying, if you really want to risk it all for me and be reminded to risk it all for me, then you need to be people who are considerate as you deal with one another. The only way that these two sisters were ever going to be brought back together was for people in the church to spend time being considerate of each of their feelings and each of their concerns, but working through them knowing full well that God has it in control and God is able to bring them back together. Do we believe that God can use us in just a a few moments at a checkout counter to say a few words, a few choice words? And by the way, you know, one of the things that I would encourage you to do this week, because I know some of you are going to be shopping throughout this week, and not all of you will be doing that online. Take some of these postcards with you. And some may not be interested. But as you're considerate and as you're gracious and as you're kind, as you're, as you're focusing on the things that are true, as you're focusing on the things that are commendable, think about offering one of these postcards, inviting that individual to the Christmas Eve service or to next Sunday service. Reminding them that in the midst of their busy day, in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of their challenge, as a result of people with heavy demands and great demands, someone stopped and smiled and expressed love and joy and consideration. And oh, by the way, in the middle of a challenging day, they gave me a card that said, would you come and join me for the celebration of Christmas. How many of us should be challenged by that? To understand that that's a part of being considerate in what Paul is talking about here when he says to us that we should be considerate in all that we do. We should remember that the Lord is coming soon. Another translation says, remember that the Lord is near. His coming is near, but more importantly, it's, that we, it's more important that we remember that he's also near to us and he's watching and he is with us. If we truly rest in the shadow of his wings, listen, he's watching. The psalmist says in Psalm 139 that there's nowhere we can go to hide from him. Even midnight is like noonday in the Father. And so it's not just a matter of us being considerate so that we might touch someone's life and encourage them and minister to them in a, in a way of kindness. But it's also recognizing the fact that, hey, we want to honor the Lord who is watching over us and caring for us. And by the way, maybe, maybe just encouraging us with a little nudge, now's the time to be kind and considerate and gracious and compassionate. And by the way, remember the postcard? Risk it for Jesus and give it to them and see if they might show up and leave the results to the Heavenly Father because only He can truly draw you or me or someone else to the understanding of Jesus and what He's done for them. But He wants to use us as an extension of His love and His care and His concern for that individual. Be considerate be kind. Man, listen, that's hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it hard to do? Okay, it's all right. We're in church. You can be honest. It's hard at times, especially when you're stretched to the limit on patience, right? And sometimes that's all about the kids. Kids are driving me crazy. I remember my mother saying when I was, when we were kids, there were three of us. And my mother used to say to us when we really pushed her buttons, I just do know my name, you're driving me crazy. Pushing to the limit. And yet it is in the limit 
It is the, in the limit when God shows up in your life and in my life and he begins to say to us, now rejoice. This circumstance, this challenge, this trial, it's not all about you. It's about my honor and my glory. It's really about you allowing me to win the day. Are we at the place where we're willing, willing to risk it all so that Jesus can win the day? And you know, there's not a one of us in this room that when we think about that, we don't have to go back and say, man, how many times have I blown it today? Today. But he's wanting us to understand that if we are to bring joy to the world, and I love that song we sing at Christmas, Joy to the World, the Lord is born. Joy to the world, and joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. Let your life be the song that God employs to bring praise and joy to those around us. We think of and we sing that song and we say, oh, we know what that means. That means that Jesus came into the world and he is the joy of the world. Yes, he is. And guess what? When you opened your heart and your life to receive him as Lord and Savior, then that joy was transferred to you and the joy that is his and that is him now resides in you. And so now you are to be the extension of his joy to the world and joy on the earth. Therefore, employ your voice, employ your life, employ your actions to share the joy. Because listen, the rocks, the hills, and the fields, they're all singing his praise. How about you? How about me? as we're confronted by the challenges of life and the circumstances of life. And you see, sometimes we, we simply say, but there's too many uncertainties to, to really live this out. I'm not sure how people are gonna receive that. What, what if that person is angry with me if I give them a card that invites them to church for Christmas Eve? Well, what if they're overjoyed because you asked them to come? So who misses out on the blessing? If they come and they're grateful that in the midst of their challenging day, someone stops to be kind and considerate and loving and expresses the truth and expresses that which is honorable and expresses that which is commendable and that which is lovely and that which is right and that which is just. In that moment, they receive that card and maybe they'll say, no, I don't have any interest in that. And you say, okay, that's fine. But maybe they'll say, yes, thank you so much. And may, may surprise you that they show up and then you have an opportunity to say praise be to God God used me to bring a little joy into the life of another person and quite possibly someone that you didn't know other than the fact that they were running the cash register as you were checking out or maybe the person at the fast food counter This is what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is the fact that he's not denying the fact that when you, when you drive through the drive-thru and it's supposed to be fast food and you've been there 20 minutes, it's, 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 it, he's not denying the fact that that's gonna disturb you a little bit. But he is saying, put on Jesus and be kind and considerate and gracious as he is kind and gracious to you, as he's waiting on you all the time to tune in to what he's saying to you. Aren't you grateful that Jesus didn't give up because instead of taking three minutes to get your Big Mac, it took 15? He's still waiting. And guess what? 
He still knows your name and he's still calling your name. It's time that we recognize that as we celebrate Jesus and his coming and the manger scene and the innkeeper and the shepherds and the wise men and all of these stories that are so important to the message of Christmas, we need to be reminded that the true message of the, Christ, of the Christmas story is Jesus coming into the world. Everyone else had a role to play. Now, what is your role and how are you playing it out? Your role is to be an extension of God's joy. And how do you display that? How do you go about that? You go about that by being considerate and kind and compassionate. By bringing honor to the name of the Lord, who by the way, you now represent. You bear his name. You are his child. And everyone knows and should know that you bear his name. Do they see you risking it all to share the joy that is yours? Not because God has made demands on you, but because God met the demand that made you right with him as a result of Jesus giving his life for you. Some of you may say, well, Brother Chuck, there's just too much uncertainty. I, I don't know how someone would respond if I offered them a card or if I was trying to be kind to them. I don't know how they would respond. There's just a lot of uncertainty. Listen, the Bible is full of, of uncertainty. The Bible is full of people who were faced with uncertainties. I think about da Daniel, for instance. You remember the story of Daniel? Daniel was the guy that was one of the brightest, a member of the greatest generation of Israel. But he was taken from his homeland at the hands of the conquering Babylonians and he was carried into the exile. And he was there and he was made to serve them. And yet in the midst of the uncertainties, Daniel remained true to who he was and to his God. And when they sought to have him eat things that he was not allowed to eat as a result of God's command in his life, he said, no, I choose to just eat the vegetables. If you'll give those to me, God will prove himself faithful. And you'll recall the story of how Daniel and his friends who remained faithful to the teaching of the scripture how they all progressed and they were better than all the rest who ate the foods of the Babylonians. You'll recall how God blessed and how God in the midst of Daniel's uncertainties elevated him to a place where he became the counselor to the king. When the king trusted no one else, he trusted Daniel. There were a lot of uncertainties about that. I'm not in my homeland. I'm not where I need to be. There's no temple here for me to worship. Daniel never allowed that to keep him from worshiping God. He never allowed it to keep him from risking all for God. And even when they conspired against him and said, we know how to get rid of Daniel. We know how to trap the king. We'll just make the king say and declare to all of the country that he is God and he's the only God and anyone that bows to another God will lose their life. You recall? You remember the story? A lot of uncertainties in Daniel's life. Daniel said, no, I will not bow. And they watched and they saw him, they brought witnesses against him, and the king was trapped, the king had no choice but to throw Daniel in the lion's den. You remember the story? The king was heartbroken, the king was distraught over what they had done to him because he allowed his pride to get in the way and his choice servant, Daniel now was uncertain, certain to die at the hands or at the mouth of the lions. Daniel said, don't worry, king. 
my God will protect me. Remember how it came out? There were a lot of uncertainties. Think about that. You know, it's one thing for us to think about being kind and considerate and doing the things that are commendable and that are just and right and lovable. A lot of uncertainties about that, how people are going to respond, especially in our world today, where people are shooting cars because they're upset at how people are driving on the road. Uncertainties. But think about this, Daniel was faced with the fact that he was about to be tossed into the lion's den. There was more than one lion in that den, by the way. Have you ever faced that? Have you ever faced that uncertainty? Do you believe what the Word of God says? Do you believe that God really rescued Daniel, or do you think that's just something that's made up? Do you not understand that the same God that protected Daniel in the lion's den is the same God that's saying to you, risk it all for Jesus? Be kind and compassionate and caring. Think about the things that are right and just and lovable and commendable and honorable, things that bring me honor. Listen, when you read the full story of Daniel, guess what happens? God is glorified as a result of Daniel in the midst of his uncertainties saying God is still king, he's still on the throne. Do we believe that today? Do we really believe that Jesus is Lord of all? Do we believe that Jesus is Lord over all the things that we see happening around us? Do we believe Jesus still is the answer? Then why are we not risking it all for him? By rejoicing being considerate in all things, knowing that Jesus is coming soon and that someone in our lives, someone in our sphere of influence, their eternal hope and the possibility of being introduced to their eternal hope, the Lord Jesus may may be dependent upon us being faithful to do what? To not worry about anything Instead, to pray about everything with thanksgiving and to thank God for all that he's already done for us and to know that when we do, his peace will come and the peace that passes anything that we can understand is going to protect not only our heart but also our mind so that we think about him, that we don't, be cons- we don't become consumed with the overwhelming discouragement that's all around us but rather that as we walk in the purpose of the Lord and we find ourselves trusting him and as we rest in his peace his shalom his presence that he's protecting us he's keeping us and as we do that then we begin to allow ourselves to do what we've been called to do and it's really not doing what we've been called to do because Jesus has not asked us to do anything Jesus has simply said to us, be who you are. You are a new creation. Walk in me. Walk in my life. Walk in my power. Walk in my promise. Be who you are. Act naturally. Live out that new creation, that new nature that is yours now that you are in Christ. Risk it all for him knowing that at the end of the day, his peace will be with you and you'll be able to be encouraged by him. Some of you may be thinking, it's too late for me. It's never too late. Saying, you you don't know what I've done. What you've done is no different than what Peter did. And yet, after it was all said and done, Jesus, uh, Peter had gone back to his fishing boats. Jesus made a trip out to the lake and called Peter back and said, listen, we need to have a conversation. It's not too late for you, Peter. Do you love me? 
Lord, you know I love you. Then go and tend my sheep. It's too late. You have no idea what I've done, and God could never forgive me. Listen, there was a criminal, a murderer that was on the cross next to Jesus, and in the last few breaths of his life, he reached over, he leaned over, and he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, today you are forgiven. Today you are forgiven. It's not too late to risk it all for Jesus and to be kind and considerate and to be loving. <laughs> you know, people will, will embrace the Jesus that you claim more readily if they see Jesus in you. We need to stop trying to convince people of how much we love Jesus with our words and we need to show them how much we love Jesus in the way we love them and care for them, right? It's not too late. It's not too late for you or me or anyone else to allow Jesus to turn this thing around so that we begin to risk it all for him knowing full well that he gave it all for us. And we'll see what God does as we're considerate and gracious and as we focus on that which is true and that which is honorable and that which is commendable and that which is excellent, morally excellent, that which is just. What a difference it'll make in your life and in mine and what a difference it'll make in the lives of people around us. That with a simple gesture of kindness and consideration may open the door to an invitation that leads to a transformation, that leads to a promise that only God can make. But today, today, he's saying to us, risk it all, risk it all for me. You become an extension of the gift of Christmas because you are the reason for the season. And the lost and the broken and the downtrodden, they are the reason for the season because Jesus came to live among us that we might live with him forevermore. Amen? Let's stand together. Joel is going to come and we're extending an invitation this morning. Maybe this morning you've never opened your heart to Christ. You've never found him as the Lord over your sin, Lord over your death, Lord over your life. But today, if you will trust him, he is calling you home. Would you hear him today? Would you listen to that voice that's been speaking to you in your inner being? Would you come to him? Maybe today it's to come and unite with this fellowship as a believer. We invite you to come. Maybe a family today comes as we saw in the first service today. You come just now. We'll not linger long, but this moment is for you. This is your time to respond to the Lord. You come just now. Are you hurting and We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of Victory Live. This is your personal invitation to visit us next week for worship on the Victory Baptist campus. To find weekly worship schedules, upcoming events, or to learn about better connecting with Victory Baptist, please visit vbcmtj.org. Our prayer is that the live broadcast of this week's worship gathering has helped you to grow in your walk with Christ. And again, thanks for joining us today for Victory Live.